So we're in our second week of spring cleaning. And today we're going to be exploring how we can kind of clean out anxiety. Anybody feeling anxious? Hmm? A little fearful, wondering what's going on? Things are topsy-turvy. I think anxiety is kind of like the dust bunnies in my house. I don't know if any of you have had those, but we're, um, they just seem to accumulate. It comes back again and again, and then all of a sudden, if you know, I open the door and there's a breeze, all of a sudden they stir up and they kind of move around, and then I finally see them again. And during times of stress and strain and upset, it's um, like this COVID-19 pandemic has been causing. It's almost like God is taking us as a little sl snow globe and shaken up. And we get to see all that debris kind of flying around and going like, ah, there it is. We didn't see it for a while, but when times get tough, all of a sudden our anxieties are present. And we're going to be looking at how we can rid ourselves of that anxiety by learning to wait on the Lord. That is a cliche phrase, and I know people talk about it all the time, but what do I really know about waiting on the Lord? Um, I can talk about it and throw it out there, but I think we're going to learn that the depth of, that, uh, of what that really means in the Bible from a passage as we read through the prophet Habakkuk chapter 2. And Habakkuk writes, I will take my stand at my watch post and will station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision waits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Waiting on the Lord, what does that mean? What is it really about? I think the only time I really learn about what waiting on the Lord is when I actually have to wait. And from Habakkuk today, I think we're going to learn in this book four different ways to deepen the understanding of what we mean by waiting in the Lord and what God is doing during a time of waiting, how he is doing some spring cleaning in our lives. So we're going to look at this phrase and we'll learn from this that we can learn to wait on the Lord patiently, perspectively, obediently, and then theocentrically. We'll take these one at a time. First of all, patiently. You know, when everything is not making sense, when you're confused by the different opinions and conflicting ideas that are flowing around you and when you're not quite sure what's right, what's up, what's down, when life is perplexing plexing, and God doesn't seem to be doing the things that you thought he would do, it's not straightforward in your way, I think you understand what Habakkuk was going through. You see, the book of Habakkuk starts with Habakkuk looking at his society, his culture, the people of God in Israel at the time, and he complains to God about all the injustice he sees and all the issues that are going on, and God responds to Habakkuk and his cry about the distortions and confusion in his society, and God says, oh, great, yes, I will do something about that, Habakkuk. I'm going to take the godless nation of Babylon and bring it to clean house among God's own people, and I'm going to bring them in, this godless nation, and take you off into captivity. And Habakkuk goes like, well, what, huh? Wait, are you, what? How, how is that? You're going to take a more unjust culture to work, he, he's confused by what God is doing. Much like I think some of us are kind of confused as to what is all going on right now in our world. And so Habakkuk then responds with this passage that we just read. And he is trying to figure out, God, how are you going to be using a godless nation to do this? And how is this going to work out for your godly purposes in this world? And we learn 
Habakkuk is going to tell us the best thing we can do right now is, even if it seems slow, the passage says, wait for it. Be patient. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, I wish I could be patient, you know, but as if patience is some kind of genetic trait that some people have and some people don't. But according to the Bible, patience is not something you have naturally. No one is naturally patient. Rather, patience is an inherent trait, not an inherent trait, excuse me, that a few lucky people have. It is a practice a disposition that one learns and God teaches. Patience comes actually from a few things that we clean out of our lives to allow other things to come in. And the first thing is that we're cleaning out my sense, your sense of omniscience over what's going on and have instead an attitude of humility. Now, two different uh, passages I want to share with you that kind of clarify this. One is from the lips of Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? In other words, do you really, what, what does your anxiety do for you? How does it benefit you? Can it actually even add a moment to your life? No, it's most of the anxiety I have in my life takes away diminishes the life that I actually have. And then from the book of James, which is very similar in style and uh, format to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, James says this, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You know, we think, we know, we assume We know how things ought to be in this world, and we're sure of ourselves and sure of our plans and sure of our expectations. And when things don't go the way we expect, all of a sudden, the worry just blows up. And we even can get angry and frustrated or despair and go like, oh, it's never going to work out. But Habakkuk and James say these feelings are not inevitable. You don't have to worry. And one way to get out of worry is to sweep out this whole understanding of that. You are omniscient and you know what it's supposed to be like. So often we're anxious when we assume we know what should be going on and when it doesn't meet our sense of purpose. We say, this is awful. Why? Because, well, X, Y, Z didn't happen, and therefore this isn't going to happen, and then this. And we just go off in these tangents as if we know how the world is supposed to work, as if we are God, omniscient, and able to see the whole picture, and we can't hardly see anything. And that's one huge reason why people are anxious right now and fearful is because they think they know. So just put in the trash bin the whole sense that you are omniscient right now. Do some spring cleaning and you'll become a lot happier when you let God be the one who knows. And we only partly know at best. Because we have a sense of humility about what we really understand God is doing and let him be God and not ourselves. And another way to bring about cleaning is to clean out a comfort mindset that we have and to bring in and replace it with a growth mindset. You know, most of us, when we see a difficult time and things are happening, we don't say, oh, great. We don't have patience in the middle of it. We don't say, oh, great. This is a great opportunity right now in this difficult time to grow into the person I've always wanted to be and God has wanted me to be. Do you say that? I don't say that. No, and that's why I'm bringing it up. (laughs) Because we don't think that way. When we see tough times, we... Our patience is short, and instead we just say, quick, how can we get back to... How can I get back to my comfort? And we, quote, solve the problem by just trying to figure out a way to get back into a sense of comfort and ease and the way it was and knowing what's going on. 
We see a problem, we try to overcome the problem, we miss out on the growth. You know, I believe I had a conversation this week with one of our members here at Thrive, and she said that she thought that the COVID-19 situation was going to be around as long as God had some things to teach us through it. And I thought, yeah, that's probably right, but then, oh, Lord, have mercy, because I don't think we've learned much to this point at all from it. Our focus and so many people are focusing, and the media is focused. Everybody's trying to focus on how do we get back to? How do we get back to normal? How do we solve this? How do we, instead of how can I grow? What can I learn? How is this stretching me? How can I grow in my patience? How can I grow in the depth of my character? You see, when you meet disappointments, when you meet tough times with patience, and when you try to grow through those tough times and see what God is doing, it's amazing what God works. And in the end, what he is refining and renewing in you. James brings this up in his letter in the first chapter, right away at the beginning. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And uh, Paul says much the same in the book of Romans, where he writes, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So when trouble hits, either it will drive you to a deeper prayer life than you've ever had before, or it'll drive you to a worse prayer life than you ever had before. When trouble hits, you'll either flail around, I guess I should be going this way, and, and not grow at all in any way, or you will grow closer to God and closer to the character that he wants. Are you seeking comfort or looking for God's purpose in it? Are you trying to find out how you can grow in it? What can I learn from this? How can I become more like the character of Jesus Christ? So Habakkuk calls us in that sense to clean out that sense of omniscience from our life, to trash that place of just trying to seek comfort in our lives and to grow and to wait on the Lord and be patient. Secondly, perspectively, we wait on the Lord. What do I mean by that? Well, Habakkuk says this, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. So Habakkuk uses the, um, the metaphor of being a watchman in a tower high above a city wall in that period of time, looking out from that vantage point as broadly and widely and as far and as clearly as possible. And that's what we need as we wait on the Lord in this situation. Instead of being filled with anxiety and being blinded by the moment and only seeing what's in front of us and our lack of comfort and peace, we need to see God's perspective on how this all fits together and have that broader perspective. Paul does something like that in the book of Romans where he writes in Romans chapter 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. I don't know if you realize this. Paul, he did not have a comfortable life. It was difficult. He struggled mightily as a follower of Jesus. He wasn't rewarded. He wasn't patted on the head. He wasn't patted on the back. He wasn't given over to all sorts of wonderful rewards for everything that he did. No, often he was jailed. He was beaten. He was persecuted. He was ridiculed. He was cast out of one town after another. He was betrayed by some close associates at times. He faced imprisonment. He was whipped. He was left for dead. And he's the one who says, yeah, Looking at all of that, it's nothing. It's this big compared to the glory God has for me. That's the perspective we can have, even in a time like today. Now, you might be saying to yourself right now, I am facing financial ruin. 
the broader perspective is the only debt that is going to actually do eternal damage to you has already been paid by Jesus Christ upon the cross. And you have the wealth of all eternity in your God who has made everything in front of you. And even all the wealth that you could accumulate on this earth is not worth comparing with the great glory that God has for you in a renewed heaven and a new earth in a home of righteousness with him that you will have forever. You might say, hey, I could get sick. I mean, this could really cause some devastation to my body, but the only sickness that could cause eternal destruction has been taken care of by Jesus Christ, and by his wounds we have been healed. The sickness of sin is taken out of your life. You say right now, my country itself is facing a crisis, and I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. But you and I, we have been given a citizenship in heaven that cannot be taken away from us. Our status has been completely given to us through Jesus Christ. Do you see how this works? You put our struggles in the face of the promises of God and a broader, fuller perspective of what God is doing in this world and what God has already accomplished for you in Jesus Christ. And you can wait on the Lord and be patient. I think by now you realize that waiting on the Lord is not inactivity. It's not just sitting there. It means to be proactively thinking, to be logically working through and holding on tightly to the promises of God and realizing the implications of such and having that deliberate perspective. So we wait on the Lord patiently. We wait on him perspectively, and we wait on him obediently. Habakkuk, again, in this first uh, verse, says, I wait, will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower. Now, this is a military metaphor, by the way. And you know that in the military, when someone is to be at their post watching for the enemy, that's what they need to do. You don't fall asleep. You don't abandon your post. You stay at your post. You stay attentive. You stay alert. And you continue to watch. You know, even though Habakkuk is struggling with God in this book and having some of the deepest questions about God's purposes in this world, the one thing he says is, I will not abandon my post. I'm going to wait until God answers me. From this, he is saying, hey, you might be weary. You might feel God is even absent like I did. You might not be getting any thrills anymore out of your relationship with God. Your prayers may not be answered, but don't give up your post. Wait obediently. You know, waiting around, again, is not just hanging out and waiting for something to happen. According to the Bible, waiting around is an active, attentive event. In, we call them waiters and waitresses at restaurants, and they're not just hanging out, looking around. They're attentively serving and giving and doing at the very time they are waiting on us and serving us. That's the kind of waiting we can do right now. You know, when God seems to be absent or when things are happening that are difficult and we grow weary, so often people just kind of give up and stop and they just kind of hang out and, quote, wait until something good happens. That's not the biblical waiting. No, the time of waiting like this, you can still do even more. You can be involved in reading your Bible even more. You can have a deeper prayer life than ever before. You can be involved in a Zoom huddle where we are gathering with other Christians, praying for each other and learning of God's ways and love and mercy together. There are deliberate times that we can, under our circumstances, do something right now as we are waiting. Someone might say, well, I tried, but you know, I wasn't getting anything out of it. So, and it seemed pointless. Can you imagine that kind of a response to defense 
that a soldier might have. He left his post at a critical time. He stopped watching for the enemy. And then he is accused and in the court of law and before a judge and the judge looks at him and says, so what do you have in de your defense to say? And he responds, well, you know, I wasn't getting anything out of it. It seemed pointless. <laughs> and the judge looks at him and says, oh, well, because you thought it was pointless and not, well, sure, we'll drop all charges. No, that's not the way it works. You might be saying right now, well, I've been praying, but I'm not getting anything out of it. I will tell you one thing for sure. You will definitely not getting anything out of not praying, okay? What does leaving your post look like today? I think it's leaving your position that you have in Jesus Christ. That is, what has been given you, what you stand on, who he has been, what he has accomplished for you already, that is your post, that is your position, don't ever leave it. I know in times of crisis, in times of difficulty, in times like this, it's easy to get weary and tired and, you know, and just kind of wanting to give up and you get out of good habits and you get into some bad habits and people are looking for feeling good and so they turn to things like money or sex or drugs or alcohol or food and all of a sudden we're trying to find our comfort and from those types of things in some way and for a moment you might feel good but the long haul you realize how destructive it can be that's leaving your post that's leaving your position you have in Jesus Christ instead you take your stand and say hey right now I know I don't feel comfortable I don't like this I want to feel good but God I know you are my greatest good and you are my source of comfort and I'm going to turn over all my desires to you right now and all these conflicts going in my life and I ask the Lord that you fulfill them in the, a way that is not destructive but is actually helpful and purposeful I'm not going to attempt to find my happiness in things that will only distract me from you, God, but I am turning them all over to you. That's holding on to your post. That is waiting obediently. That is cleaning out all the clutter that would get in the way of your waiting and the character that God is creating in you as a result. Obediently, prospectively, patiently, and finally, theocentrically. It's a huge word, but it really means God-centered, God-focused. You know, so often a lot of Christians have come into the church and been part of the church, and I can't help it. I was, I've been this way many times as well. And what I'm really trying to get from God is not God, but things that God can do, the benefits. You know, it's like get my prayers answered, get this, get that, but not God. And when I don't get what I want, um, well, you know. So far, so good. You've heard of fair weather friends, right? There are people that might hang out with you when times are good or when you've got something to offer them, when you've got money to spend and places to go that are exciting on their part, but when you don't, all of a sudden they disappear. They're gone. And you know how that hurts. And you can see the hypocrisy in that, and you can go like, they weren't even a friend at all if they can't be here when I actually need them. And what we see in other people and how they are up and down and only there for the benefits and not for the true friendship, we don't see that that's how we have been treating God. People can see hypocrisy in their relationship, everything down to just a little transaction of as long as they get something out, but we don't see how we've treated God. And people have said that, you know, I prayed and I went to church and did that thing and... Well, I wasn't getting anything from it, so I just stopped the whole religion thing. And they start to treat God the way they would never, ever want a friend to treat them. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? It means to love Him for who He is and to see in Him a friendship that you can never have anywhere else. And even when you don't feel like you're getting a benefit out of it at the moment, you stick with it. That's what true love is. When you don't get a benefit from something, 
and you still love. I think what happens is God is really doing some spring cleaning when those types of times come into your life. When you feel like, God, I've been praying, I'm not getting anything. God, I've been worshiping, I've been faithfully doing these things. I'm not feeling anything. I'm not getting the benefits that I'd expect. And God is saying, okay, now is the time we will see if you got into this relationship with me to worship me or to get me to worship and serve you. He's cleaning out my selfish motives at those moments, my anxiety, self-centered ways. And if I learn to love him in those dark times of darkness and difficulty, it's amazing when that darkness lifts what God has been doing in my character, turning it into one of beauty and depth and grace. The more you focus on God, the more you will love and respond to his love with love, that you will respond to his grace with grace to others. The more you will respond to his faithfulness by your faithfulness, the more you respond to his mercies by being merciful. Think about it. The one who waited patiently, perspectively, obediently, and theocentrically, the only one I know, was Jesus himself. What did he get out of it? Why did he endure it? Why would he leave the glory of eternity in the Father's fullness of love and the Spirit's abiding communion to come to this earth? What reward? You know, the thanks that a few people gave him for a few healings here and there could not compare one iota to the immensity of God's pleasure, the Father's pleasure with his Son or the fact that uh, he was able to have people listen to his teaching and a few of them actually respond could not compare at all to how his father heard him completely from the beginning, loved him with absolute love, and deferred to him and gave to him everything. No, there was nothing in it for Jesus. In fact, you could say that he felt it was pointless, it was purposeless, it was worthless. He got nothing out of it, but he never, ever left his post. And his post was not on some high tower overlooking a valley. No, it was when he was nailed to a cross under the black darkness of a sky with God's wrath coming down upon our sin and his friends abandoned him and an angry crowd ridiculed him. He never left his post. And he didn't do it so that he'd never leave you. He's not in it for himself. He's not in it for his glory. He's not in it for his pleasure. He is in it for you. And when you start to realize what Jesus Christ has done for you, what he has accomplished for you, what he is doing for you, when you realize all that God is and all that he has done, all of a sudden, it's not so hard to be theocentric, that is, to focus on him and to wait with patience and perspective and even with obedience during tough times. Spring cleaning. I think God may be doing it in some people's lives. Maybe you haven't uh, felt close to God for a long time and all of a sudden you realize how much you need him. Um, I think it was Wyatt last week or the week before was talking to me um, before or after one of our services and saying, you know, he's noticed there have been a number of people who have felt a need now all of a sudden to come closer to God and to even be baptized because they hadn't been baptized before and they felt like, wow, I've been living my life and all these things and all this clutter was getting in the way, but now I realize what's really important. If you happen to be there right now, realizing God has been doing that work in you, we at Thrive want to be there for you. We are ready and willing to serve you and to bring you through the waters of baptism and have God's promises placed on you, be identified and united with Jesus Christ, given his life, death, and resurrection and raised to a new life. We'd love to do that for you. 
But for any of us, I think, this is a time that God is doing his work. He's cleaning out some of the clutter in our lives and in our culture. And he is cleaning out and giving us even more of his love, more of his grace, more of his peace, more of his presence, more of the reality of what life should be. And that is what we are hoping happens during this time and in this series called Spring Cleaning. As Habakkuk said in this letter, and it was used as a phrase throughout a number of books in the New Testament, the righteous shall live by faith. That is what we are hoping for today, that you live by faith and trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you this day for the work that you are doing in our lives. Um, We didn't realize how much anxiety we had until a situation like this came up. We didn't realize how much we thought we knew that our omniscience and our, (laughs) that we thought we were omniscient, that we figured out what should be happening and we've lost that. Give, clean out, Lord, that sense of omniscience. Take away uh, the sense of entitlement. Uh, Give to us your humility. Grant to us, Lord, as well, a perspective to see just how these moments in time, this year of 2020, fits into your bigger picture in our lives and the lives of your kingdom. We pray that you would be working, Lord, as well in us, not only patience and perspective, but that we would hear your word and obey even when it doesn't feel good. And that we would learn what a friendship with you really means. And that through, Lord, our um, uh, responding to your word, and to your grace and your goodness and your promises that we obediently follow, that you would be working in us the depth of character that you intend us to have, that this would be a time that we keep growing closer to you. And finally, Lord God, that we see your perspective in our lives. And Lord Jesus, all that we are amazed at these days, it's not, wow, look at this or look at that, but look at you and look at what you've done for us and how you want us and that you went through hell and back to have us, that you would never leave us. You never left your post. You never left the position of servant. You gave up your life to have us. We want you now that to, here we are, we are yours. All this we pray, Lord Jesus, in your name. We're gonna continue um, for a few other um, prayers as well. A number of our Thrive uh, Campus Ministry members are starting to go through finals uh, this week and next. We'll pray for their studying. We'll also lift up, Lord, our essential workers and uh, safety of our health care staff. These are some of the prayer requests that have come in this day. Um, and um, as we pray, I just want to also bring up a couple of points. Of course, you can give to this ministry for the sake of reaching out to this community. You can give online in a variety of ways. We'd love to connect with you and know how we can serve you. And like I said, within about five minutes or so after worship today, um, join us in the Zoom huddle. I'll do it as quickly as I can so we can have a time of communion. Let's pray. Lord God, we do lift up again the safety of our healthcare workers, our essential workers who are doing so many ministries. We are finding out in this upside down, inside out time, just who is essential and how important people can be. And some of the lowly or underpaid positions in our society, we pray, Lord, that you would truly um, give them honor and grace and protection. We lift up our students, Lord, who are now um, online working uh, to learn from home we pray that you'd bless their, um, their learning, their studying, be with them through their finals, have them grow in ways that go beyond whatever grade they get to be the person you want them to be and walk them through the path you have before them. Lord God, for anyone who is wondering about their status with you right now, we pray, Lord, you would show them your love, your mercy, and your grace We know your word is true, that you forgive everyone their sins to those who confess and turn to you. And Lord God, we thank you that your spirit has moved us to turn to you. And Lord Jesus, 
we're just going to pray as your family again today, the prayer you taught us, because it's the prayer that sums up all of our thoughts and needs in one today. So hear us, Lord, as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again for being part of Thrive. I ask that you now go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.